Professor Balka, you're going to start now. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Fritz Boykers. He obtained his PhD in 1979 from the University of Leiden and is now a professor at Utrecht University. Uh, one of his early uh, significant results was uh, a new proof of uh, Aperi's famous result that the Riemann zeta function is irrational at the points uh, two and three. And more recently, he's done a lot of work on hypergeometric functions. And that's going to be the title of the, of the talk for today. So, Professor Boykers. Okay, well, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much once again for having me here in this, uh, in this seminar. Um, so, um, the, this next hour, I'm going to tell you about hypergeometric functions in several variables. However, uh, this doesn't do quite justice to the subject since it, it is possible to, to give an entire course on this uh, subject. And uh, certainly won't be able to tell you everything, but I hope at least that, uh, that by telling you some of the things, I may arouse some of your uh, interest in this. So let's start with uh, the first slide I was going to say. However, ah. Now it works. Okay, so in the last lecture we discussed the uh, the Gauss hypergeometric function in, in one variable, and let me remind you of this. It was defined by a, a power series, and it's had these Pochhammer type uh, coefficients, where this is the notation that we usually have for the so-called Pochhammer symbol, which is a shifted factorial. And the second main ingredient uh, beside this power series was also the fact that this satisfies a second order linear differential equation. Then in the previous lecture, I also discussed, uh, well, some generalizations of this power series, which consists in, in expanding the number of Bohammer symbols over here. And in that sense, you would get higher order uh, linear differential equations uh, and, and as well. And um, if we go over to the case of uh, several variables, well, this is also a very classical subject. And uh, actually, the, the, the generalization simply consists of increasing the number of variables as well as the number of Pochhammer symbols. I will show you the uh, first uh, few examples, which were invented around 1880 by Appel. So here are the four famous Appel functions. And you see it's, it's getting quite cumbersome. So I don't expect you to remember all these formulas, but uh, we can just have a look and see what, what, uh, what, what, what they look like. So for example, here we have the F1, which is a, a function which has four parameters, the alphas, beta, beta, beta prime, and gamma, and X and Y are now the complex variables. And it's defined by this power series where you see this combination of, of Pochhammer symbols. And he also introduced F2, F3, F4, and, uh, the, the, well, if you look at them, the, the, this may seem a, a little bit uh, haphazard what has happened here, but essentially, if you look, for example, at the uh, indices of the Pochhammer symbols, for example, over here, this one, this one, and this one, and you add them up, uh, you get 2m plus 2m. Same thing for the Pochhammer indices in the denominator. Now you will also find 2m plus 2m. And actually, uh, th th this fact uh, corresponds to, to the fact that these uh, functions are going to satisfy second order partial uh, differential equations. And essentially, uh, the combinations that you find here uh, are all, all the possible combinations of power series in two variables which satisfy second order differential equation. And the product of two Gauss hypergeometric functions, one in X and one in Y, is excluded from this uh, from this list. So uh, Appel worked with them, and well, not much later there were some uh, generalizations. By the way, here you find a system of partial differential equation uh, for the uh, Appel hypergeometric function f4, and as you see. It's, uh, it looks a bit nasty in comparison with the Gauss uh, differential equation. 
And as you go along, these equations will even look nastier and, and nastier. And I think this is also the, uh, 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 the, the, the cause for the bad reputation of uh, hypergeometric functions, if you go further. Namely, uh, it's, uh, it's, it looks like a complete collection of, of formulas which get ever more complicated. And uh, well, I hope that uh, during this lecture, uh, we'll, we'll bring some uh, relief in this. So as I said, there were further generalizations to, to the famous Laricella uh, hypergeometric functions. Uh, these are hypergeometric functions in n variables instead of two variables, one or two variables. And here I use some vector notation. So whenever you see a bold face parameter, it simply means a set of n parameters. And we use the uh, vector notation. So x to the n is basically x1 to the m1, et cetera, up to xn to the xm. And uh, this absolute value simply denotes the sum of the, uh, the, the summation uh, indices. And this is also a product notation for, for this uh, product of Pochhammer symbols. Well, we don't have to remember those either, but I just mentioned them here. And so if you take the case of two variables, they actually reduce to the Appel functions, which were on the previous page. And of course, when the number of variables is decreased to one, all these functions uh, reduce to the Gauss hypergeometric uh, function. There are more generalizations. Uh, in fact, there are too many generalizations, but at least I'll discuss one more. Uh, you may have heard about the Almoto Gelfand functions. So they were basically introduced by uh, Almoto in the late 1970s. And what he did was really mimic the Euler integral, which exists for the, uh, uh, for, for the uh, Gauss hypergeometric function to the, the several variable setting. So what he did was take a whole bunch of linear functions, n of them in k variables, x1 up to xk. And uh, the coefficients are then the variables of the hypergeometric series. And so then you can write down this uh, integral over a closed loop, which uh, and you raise these f's to certain powers, which may be non-integers, they may be fractions, or they may even be real numbers. And you have to take a kind of so-called Pohama contour to allow for the uh, for the multivalueness of this this argument this. Uh, uh, integrant. But anyway, uh, let's forget about the details. As functions of the coefficients of the fi, these also satisfy differential equations and they can also be considered as hypergeometric functions. You also see the name Gelfand there because somewhat later Gelfand was also interested in similar kinds of, uh, of integrals. Well, there are many more generalizations, but uh, uh, oh, by the way, I don't know if you've heard about the book Hypergeometric Functions My Love by uh, Masaki Yoshida. And this is dedicated to the geometry of the Aomoto integrals for the case where you have n linear forms in three variables. And this corresponds to six lines in the projective plane. And there, Yoshida, he analyzes completely what happens uh, with the solutions of these differential equations, what kind of mapping properties they, they have. He studies the corresponding Schwartz map, which we've also seen in the previous lecture. And uh, so it's a, a, a beautiful uh, study of this uh, particular case. There are many more generalizations, but I won't try to, I won't even try to mention all of them, except just mentioned one very interesting book by Bernard Dwork. 1990s. It's called Generalized Hypergeometric Functions. And uh, <clears throat> in a sense, this is a very strange book. Uh, the point is that it's rather technical. And uh, I don't know many people who've actually read the book. Maybe some of the students did. But it, it, it is a, a book which contains actually a lot of material once you're able to digest what's in it. So. This is, uh, uh, this is a, a, a pity because, oh, this is a pity because uh, it's an interesting book. And the reason that Dwork wrote this book 
is that he was also interested in the arithmetic properties of hypergeometric functions. You have things like Frobenius structures of hypergeometric uh, differential equations. And Dwork was very much interested in the piadic properties. And he also studied zeta functions that were associated to these uh, hypergeometric functions. So in a sense, Bernard Dwork was a kind of a beginning of the study of hypergeometric motors, even in the most general sense uh, possible. So uh, it's, it's very much worth reading. I have only been able to decipher a, a few chapters, but uh, it, it contains a lot of material. At the same time, uh, there were some generalizations by uh, Gelfand, Krapanov, and Slavinsky giving rise to the ahypergeometric functions. And it turns out that uh, while both works appeared in the, at the same time, and if you put the two works uh, next to each other, there are amazing similarities in the presentation and uh, the ideas of, of what, what happens there. But let, enough of uh, this uh, Dwork book. Let's go over to the uh, Galfand, Kaplan, and Zilovinsky functions, namely the A hypergeometric functions. So here they are. Uh, they were introduced, as I said, by uh, Galfand, Kaplan, and Zilovinsky, and uh, they were called A hypergeometric functions. And this is a very far-reaching generalization of many of the examples that I showed in the previous slides. And the setup is quite easy, although it requires some notation. And this is a problem with the presentation of a hypergeometric functions. If you start explaining things, there are at some point so many notations that people tend to get lost, especially when you see this for the first time. So I'll try to go try to take things easy and hope that you're, you stay with me at least for, for some time. Uh, so there are only a few things that, uh, that you're expected to remember, namely the basic start with the data of a, an a hypergeometric system of equations is a matrix, which we always call A, hence the name A hypergeometric functions, and it's an R times N matrix. So there are big N columns, in this vector, um, and this is, uh, we write the columns in, in this way. And uh, th these columns, they live in R dimensional space. And this is the R that you see over here. Now we assume that the uh, the columns, if you look at the Z, the lattice generated by these uh, uh, columns, that this is precisely coincides with Z to the R. So it's not a sub lattice of Z to the R. And the second important assumption is that the, there's a linear form such that its value on the column vectors is equal to one for each column. You could also say that basically the vector with all ones is in the row span of the matrix uh, A. Uh, sometimes when I, so usually when I say A, I mean the matrix. Sometimes there's a slight abusive language in the sense that by A, I mean, the set of column vectors, but I hope this won't give too much, too many problems. Okay, this, the, this matrix is the first ingredient. And the other ingredient are, of course, parameters, because for hypergeometric functions, you need parameters. And there's a parameter vector of dimension R, and I'll introduce it by boldface alpha, and it lives, I'll take the entries to be real numbers, just as we did in the one variable case. But many interesting cases have, uh, have rational uh, parameters. So an important thing is that uh, this matrix, this integer matrix and this vector, they completely characterize uh, an ahypergeometric system of differential equation. So what we'll do now is construct the system of differential equations from these two uh, data. And we'll do this on uh, this slide. <coughs> There's a, okay, here's some more notation. Sorry about that. Uh, that's the lattice of relations. So usually the number of vectors is bigger than the dimension of the space that they live in. So there must be relations. In particular, there must be uh, integer valued uh, relations between them. And the set of integer valued relations is called the lattice of relations, which will denote by big L in this uh, sense. This is a very important uh, datum, this L. 
And uh, with this L, we can now define uh, an infinite series, which has a, well, it looks a bit awful in the beginning. However, it's, uh, if you look at it closer, it's, it has some elegance in it, but well, you have to appreciate it on closer inspection. So we introduce a formal sum, which we call phi. And uh, there are also some gammas running around. Well, what is gamma? Gammas are the coefficients which you get if you try to write alpha as a linear combination of the column vectors of the matrix A. So this parameter vector, you start writing it as a sum of the linear combination of the column vectors and the coefficients are then going to be called gammas. Of course, if you give alpha and these AIs, these gammas are not uniquely determined. So there are many different choices. Uh, let's keep those choices all at our disposal and later on we shall uh, specialize them. Now this series is a series which sums of all elements in this uh, lattice of relations. And what you do is that for each component of this uh, uh, n-tuple, you introduce a factor of this form, which is a vi. And vi are the actual coordinates of the space on which the a hypergeometric uh, differential equations are going to live. So these are basically the variables of the hypergeometric system. And they're also the variables by which the a hypergeometric functions are going to be defined. So the structure is very simple. You take a, 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 an a hypergeometric variable, you raise it to uh, this, this L1 plus gamma one, and you divide by gamma, well, with the same sum plus one. And you take the product over all components of, this, uh, of, of these vectors L. Now, this is a summation over um, uh, a lattice. So it means it's a summation in all directions. So you can hardly expect to, to have convergence at any place. Well, this is not a problem. Uh, the, the nice thing is that if you spe uh, specialize these gammas in certain sense, which I'll indicate later, then you do get convergent series and you do get true uh, solutions of differential equations. Uh, notice here the, uh, the title of the slide, which is called the mother of all solutions. Well, the thing is that if you start with this formal sum, then basically you can produce all the power series expansions that are associated to an A hypergeometric system. If you remember, uh, if you look at books, classical books, of, for example, on Appel functions, then uh, there the authors do uh, give basis of solutions of these uh, partial differential equations. And there are pages and pages of uh, power series in several variables. And it looks like, a, well, this is, this is the, 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 the zoo of functions that you, that you get, and there's hardly any structure in it. However, by this setup, uh, it turns out that all these uh, solutions, which are in these pages and pages of power series expansions, they basically all arise from this formal series expansion. And I'll try to give an indication of how you can produce uh, hypergeometric functions from start by starting from an expansion like this. So as I said, this is a formal series, but if we take special choices of uh, these uh, gammas over here, it will turn out that we have um, actual power series. Okay, so what I'll do is um, I'll give you an example, but first say something, I'll say something about the differential equations. What is the system of a hypergeometric differential equations? Well, it's a set of partial differential operators in the VIs, in the, well, the D, DVIs, that annihilate this formal series. And I could leave it at that, but I'm still, well, in a course, any course on a hypergeometric functions, one should at least show the uh, differential equations itself. I just uh, flashed them by on the next slide. Here they are. So the two types of differential equations for, for this um, a hypergeometric system, namely the box equations, and the box equations are of a very simple form. It's a product of derivatives. So these delta i's are simply these derivatives over here. 
And uh, to each L in this lattice, you associate a differential equation. For the positive components of the L, you take this uh, uh, derivative for the negative ones. Well, you just take this derivative where you uh, put a minus sign in front of the negative uh, coefficients. And so this is kind of, uh, well, physicists call it the D'Alembert type operator. Uh, here we call it box uh, operators, or they're also, these are also called structure equations. It's a very simple exercise to check that the form of series, which I gave at the beginning, does indeed satisfy this uh, type of differential equations. By the way, in principle, these are infinitely many differential equations, but it turns out that you can reduce uh, the system to a finite number of choices for these uh, lattice, uh, for these, uh, um, uh, lattice uh, vectors. There's a second type of equation. Those are the so-called Euler equations or homogeneity equations. They look a little more, more complicated and these are associated to each row of this uh, matrix A. So to each row, you associate this differential operator, never mind what it looks like. Basically, it's linear combinations of uh, kind of log derivatives. So the VIs, DDVIs, you see here, and it's kind of, uh, well, in the world of differential equations, people call this order type differential equations. And these equations always express some homogeneity property. And maybe that's more elegant to say that the Euler equations express the following. If you take any solution R of the differential equation, for example, the formal series we just have seen. And if you now apply a torus action on the space of variables of this uh, a hypergeometric system. So the torus action consists of you take the T in this torus and you raise it to the power, the first column of A up to the nth column of A. And then you let it act on each of the coordinates. And this gives you a torus action on this uh, space of, on which the A hypergeometric functions live. And this equation basically expresses the fact that the solutions of the differential equation uh, under this torus action form a character. And this equality is very trivial to check. I will not do it, but you can, you can do it if you review the slides. Uh, so basically uh, the, 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 the solutions should be characters on the torus action on the uh, space of the, uh, well, the, the background space of, of the uh, A hypergeometric systems. So these are the differential equations. I will not uh, go back to them, but what you can see is that <clears throat> whatever A or alpha you choose, the differential equations are very easy to, to write down. So there's no, you don't have to, uh, to dive into the structure of the differential equations, you just write them down. That's the beauty of this, uh, of this setup. <coughs> okay, let me give you an example. So what I'll do is I'll show you the connection of Gauss hypergeometric equation with the, uh, with the setup that I just showed you. Well, for the Gauss hypergeometric equation, we take for A, we take uh, this th three by four matrix. And the first columns are simply the base factors in three dimensional space. And the last column is, is this vector. And the thing you, you see that if you take the sum of the coordinates of each vector, it's all one. So there is the, there are indeed in, in the, the, the endpoints of these column vectors are in the shifted hyperplane, which was one of the requirements of this uh, on the first slide. And the other requirement was that the, these columns should generate all of uh, Z3. Well, this certainly happens because we also have these basis vectors. For the parameter triple, we take these numbers, where the A, B, and C are the A, B, and C, which we had seen on the first slide. And now it's our job to reduce this to the Gauss hypergeometric function. Well, uh, you see that you have four vectors, four column vectors in three space. So that means that the relations are given by these uh, numbers, by these coefficients, where n varies over the integers. Now, in order to write down this mother 
of, uh, of uh, functions, so this formal solution, you have to make a choice for this gamma. So in other words, you have to write this parameter vector, this three vector, as a linear combination of those. And what I do is there's a choice of these, uh, there's a choice for these gammas, and I'll make the choice where the fourth coefficient is zero. So I'll, I will make this choice for the linear combinations. Now I use this to write down this, uh, this phi, and now you have something that looks like, uh, like this. Note that we have four variables, which seems to be a bit much, because in the end, the Gauss hypergeometric function has only one variable, as we've seen. But OK, we'll get to that. Uh, the thing is, the summation is over lattice, so it's still over the integers n. However, by our choice of gamma, we find here the gamma factor um, gamma of n plus 1. Another the thing is, you know that if you have the argument is 0 or negative integer, this becomes infinite. And so this inverse uh, value becomes 0. In other words, essentially, this summation stretches only over the integers n greater or equal than 0. So that means actually we have now a power series expansion. So we can just to stick to this since the negative ends only give contributions, zero. So this is the power of a suitable choice of these gammas. Namely, you go from a formal solution to an actual power series. So this is the first problem removed. Now we're going to move some of these gamma factors to the numerator. And we do it by using this uh, well-known Euler identity. So that allows you to replace gamma of x by one over gamma of one minus x. I will not give you all the details, but what happens if we do this, so if we move this one and this one to the numerator, we get this. And now if you realize yourself that these gammas here are associated to the Pohama symbol in this way, you see the Pohama symbol on there. So this is true by the functional equation for the gamma function. Uh, you see that these are basically Pohama symbols that you see there up to a factor. And what you also see is that you have now power series in this combination of VIs. And if you call that Z and replace these by Pohama symbols, then you see that you have gotten, well, this dummy product times the actual uh, Gauss hypergeometric series. So this is how you get uh, get from one to the other. And in the same time, you also have also reduced the number of variables. And the idea is, uh, well, this you've seen the formulas there, but the underlying principle is that I told you that on this four space, we have a torus action, uh, which is dimension three. And if you look at this uh, space of, with this V1 up to V4 space, modular the torus action, that you give you a one dimensional quotient and the coordinates of that one dimensional quotient is our z, which you've gotten over here. Now, the thing is that uh, if you take this quotient, things tend to become very complicated. And this explains why the hypergeometric functions uh, that you see in the literature look so complicated. But if you leave it in the unquotiented form, then things are pretty simple. We can repeat this procedure. So we could also take for gamma, set of coefficients where the third coefficient is, uh, is zero. And then you get the same computation, you get a power series once more, and to your surprise, you see, you get this dummy factor again, times this power series, times the fractional uh, factor. And we have seen this in the previous, uh, 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 two days ago, sorry, two days ago, because uh, this, this was the second solution of the Gauss hypergeometric equation. And of course, you can also take gammas where uh, this uh, co coordinate is zero and this coordinate is zero, and that will produce power series solutions in one over z. And so in this way, you get all the well-known solutions up to the Gauss hypergeometric equation, just by starting with this one mother of all solutions, phi. Well, another remark is that uh, if you're given a classical hypergeometric function, like the Gauss function over here, you can reverse engineer this procedure to see what sort of a hypergeometric system you're going to get. Well, I guess I hope 
this derivation has been clear, clear enough. And I hope it's also clear that the, the derivation that, that I chose, that I showed you, uh, can be uh, worked back as a reverse engineering process. And so it's possible to go from this classical series in a reverse direction to the a hypergeometric setting. And this allows us to recover the a hypergeometric analogs of the classical hypergeometric functions. And the rule of thumb that I usually have, but if you take a series like, like this, well, you see gamma factors there and you see parameters. There are four parameters and there are six Pochheimer symbols. That means that the number of column vectors of A is going to be six. And uh, these column vectors are going to live in four dimensional space. You can immediately recognize it from this expansion that you see here. If you look at F2, F2 has five parameters and there are seven uh, Pochheimer symbols. So it means that the A hypergeometric system is going to have uh, N is seven and R is five. And uh, for F4, you will get once again, six and four. So for example, uh, in R is four, you're in four dimensional space, but as I told you, these, uh, th th these vectors, they should lie in a shifted hyperplane because of this extra condition that we had on the first slide, this height condition. And that means that you can actually make a picture in this, this case, in this case, you live in four dimensional space, but we can restrict to the hyperplane in which the endpoints of the AI live and make a picture of them. And here they are. This is the picture that, of the polytope that corresponds to F1. This is the picture that corresponds to the polytope corresponding to F4. This is a very nice geometrical view of the structure of these uh, F1 and F4. And uh, well, you see, the, the, the difference is quite strong, it's quite appealing. And it's something that you would not easily recognize from these uh, power series expansions. So that's a nice combinatorial aspect of, this, uh, of, of these functions. So here are the polytopes that correspond to F1 and F4. And if you ask what the polytope for the Gauss series was, well, we saw four vectors there. We had the three base factors, they give you three vectors. And then the, the other one was in the same plane as those uh, three basic factors. So basically the shape of the, 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 the polytope in the Gauss case was a diamond or something that looks like a square simply. Okay, well, I hope uh, this was some advertisement. Let me now make some general remarks. So I have one more notation here, C of I, C means cone, and A is still the, uh, uh, the, the matrix A or the set of column vectors. And we simply look at the positive cone spanned by the column vectors. Now there's something called uh, non-resonance for an A hypergenetic system. And that's the following. We call it non-resonant if the parameter vector which lives in R-dimensional space plus the complete uh, R-dimensional lattice has no points on the boundary of this uh, of this cone. So it's 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 a condition, but it's a condition with far-reaching uh, consequences. Uh, you know, for example, that um, one of the consequences of this that any non-resonant hypergeometric system is irreducible. I guess you know the uh, concept of irreducibility in the case of uh, ordinary differential equations. You know that's where the if it's reducible, then the, uh, the 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 differential operator factors of the of over the rational functions for uh, hypergeometric for systems of differential equations. This is slightly more subtle. I won't go into it, but the nice thing is that non-resonance corresponds to irreducibility of the A hypergeometric system. Another property, beautiful property, is that if you have a non-resonant A hypergeometric system, then, uh, well, this has a certain rank, and the rank can be described in many ways, uh, but I've, the easiest way I find that is that, that the rank is equal to the dimension of the solution space at an ordinary point of the, uh, the hypergeometric system. Maybe this is the easiest way to 
picture the rank of a system. And it turns out that the uh, rank of such an A hypergeometric system is simply related to the volume of the convex hull of the set of factors A and the origin. So you can picture yourself these factors, they start at zero and end at the uh, AIs, and take the convex hull of that, take the volume, and multiply with R factorial, because this is something that's related to R dimensional space, and that will be the dimension of the uh, solution space. So for example, let me go back to this story here. In the system F4, well, if you draw this uh, axis here, then this axis sees to it that this uh, the octahedron is this can be dissected into four uh, simply sets. I hope you can imagine this a little bit. And each of these uh, simply sets has a volume uh, one over uh, four factorial, if you multiply by four factorial. So it basically has volume. Uh, it, it's, it's a unit, it's a, it's a fundamental simplex, and there are four of them. And this means that you know immediately now that the rank of this uh, Appel F4 is going to be four. In this case, you can easily see that this can be divided into three uh, elementary simply sets. So the rank of the system F1 is going to be three. So by such combinatorial uh, considerations, it is quite easy to deduce what the uh, rank of a system of AI, AI geometric uh, equations is. So I won't be telling you too much because at this point I should probably start talking about uh, monodromy, determination of monodromy, uh, then many other things to be said. So I will not do that. So there, there's quite a bit of work on the, on the monodromy of, for example, the Lauricella functions and also on this more general case, there's uh, quite some work and I think it's, uh, well, it, th th there's some com almost complete uh, descriptions that they tend to get very technical. So that's another reason for not mentioning it in this uh, one hour lecture. Uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll uh, concentrate now on uh, some uh, subject of my, my favorite subject. And it's also the subject, well, the, the, the theme of the last lecture, namely, uh, uh, finite monodromic groups and that or equivalently algebraic algebraicity of a hypergeometric functions okay so that's what we do for the remainder of this uh, this, this lecture we'll stick to uh, algebraic functions okay here we go uh we'll so have to uh, introduce one more uh, uh, concept namely apex points. It's a very strange concept. So here we have this cone once more. And uh, what we'll do is look at this cone. And now we're going to intersect it with this shifted uh, lattice and it's shifted by the parameter vector. We've seen this last time. If this uh, shifted lattice has empty intersection with the boundary of this, the system was non-resonant. Uh, but this uh, intersection has more uh, things of interest, namely a point in this shift of lattice and which is in the cone is called an apex point. Uh, if there is this uh, strange condition holds, well, I can say it uh, in an easier way, namely the points you see here are the points of a shifted lattice. We are now in two dimensional space. So I suppose this cone CA is spent by lattice in two dimensional space. So it is, it is this nice piece of cake. And uh, the, in it, you see a, a Z2, basically, uh, which is shifted by some value, which I've chosen almost randomly. And here you see uh, this red point, and this red point has the property that it, it cannot be seen from other points in a direction which lies within the cone CA. If you take this point, for example, well, it can be seen by this point in a direction which lies in this cone. Same thing here. Uh, for example, this point can be seen from this point in a direction which also lies with, within the cone. Well, the points which cannot be seen from in cone directions from other points are called apex points. I hope this uh, intuitive uh, description is, uh, is clear enough. 
But uh, then uh, there's a very simple lemma, which is not hard to, uh, to derive, namely the number of apex points in here can be at most the rank of the a hypergeometric system. And now the, uh, we say that the number of apex points is maximal if, if this number of apex points is equal to this upper bound. So for example, here in this shift at lattice, we see two apex points. And if the rank would have been two, then, uh, then it would have been maximal. I show you, show you an example of a maximal uh, set of apex points in, in a moment. Okay, so now we get a uh, theorem that I wanted to show you. Namely, we consider a non-resonant a hyperdynamic system, and we have once again a matrix and a parameter vector, which has now rational uh, components, and uh, let n be a common denominator of these, uh, these components. And here's the theorem. The theory in which I got uh, about 10 years, well, maybe 15 years ago, but and since the, the, the uh, theorem is this, uh, the system has a solution space consisting of algebraic function, if and only if the number of apex points in here is maximal for all integers k relatively prime with m. So what you do is you look, for example, take k is one, Look at this shift of lattice, intersect with CA, count the number of apex point, and if it's maximal, you proceed to the next K, etc., until you have all the Ks up to N, which have GCD equal to one. And if those are all maximal, then, sorry, if those are all maximal, you know that you have a, a, a solution space of algebraic functions. Now, for, for those of you who have seen the, the, the previous lecture, uh, there was something in the, um, the one variable case, which was called the interlacing condition. And the interlacing condition had also something where you had to multiply the parameter vector by an integer and then check some, some conditions. And uh, you multiply them over integers which are, have GCD with the, uh, the common denominator of the parameter vectors. And this looks quite similar. Actually, uh, if you restrict this condition to the case of one variable hypergeometric function, you simply recover the interlacing condition in that case. So basically, this is a generalization of the interlacing condition in the one variable case. What I'd like to do now is uh, give you an, uh, an example. This. And this is the, an example of the so-called Horn series, G3. I haven't shown you that so far, but this is uh, also uh, a series which satisfies a system of second order linear differential equations. You can see it once more. Well, you cannot see it actually. Uh, what you can see is that if you add the Bohammer's uh, uh, indices here, you get m plus n, and here you also get m plus n. However, the strange thing with these uh, Horn series is that uh, these indices may become negative, and then you would have to go over to a slightly more general definition of Bahama symbols. What happens is, instead of rising factorials in the numerator, you get decreasing factorials in the denominator. A very strange series indeed. Anyway, it's possible to reverse engineer this. Namely, if you reverse engineer this in the way that I showed you before, you can move these Bohammer symbols to the denominator. And that means that you get the negative of these, uh, of these uh, Bohammer indices. But that means that the lattice is going to have these components, which are precisely minus this one, minus this one, and these two. So this will be the lattice of relations. And now you have to cook up some matrix A for which this is the lattice of relations. Well, that's a very easy exercise. So for the matrix A, we can take this. Of course, you can take other matrices, but they're just integer transforms of, of this one. And you can now check that, uh, that, that these vectors are all vectors uh, which give you uh, uh, which are, give you the coefficients of a linear relation between these, these columns. Let me draw a picture 
of these uh, points. Here they are. You see them over here. And uh, the gray area is really the cone, which is spanned by these red vectors. And this is, uh, this is now our CA. Okay. Furthermore, you can also see that the, the, uh, the convex hull of my set A and the origin, it has, uh, it's a triangle. You can easily see that it has volume three halves. And if you multiply this with uh, two factorial, you get three. And three is precisely the rank of the set of differential equations that corresponds to the Horn series T3. Okay, so this is the setup. And now we have to look at the, uh, the, the, the apex points. So I'm going to, now we have the same picture again as before. However, I introduced some, some dark gray over here. What does it mean? Well, it means that suppose you have now a shifted lattice and these blue points are a shifted lattice, a shifted C2. And the apex point you can immediately recognize because those are precisely the points of a shift of lattice which occur in the dark gray area. That, that's something uh, you can use. And uh, well, I won't give you the details of that, but this is a very easy pictorial way of recognizing apex points. So uh, here, the points in the dark gray area are precisely the apex points of this shifted uh, lattice. So this gives us a very simple way of uh, pictorially recognizing uh, these apex points. Okay, I've been staring at this, uh, when I wrote that paper, I've been staring at this uh, picture quite some while because the nice thing is that A is a two-dimensional set, so you can uh, actually draw pictures. For higher dimensions, this becomes quite more complicated. And I realized that if you take for alpha an arbitrary uh, rational number q, and take four parameters alpha and one minus alpha, then the shifted lattice uh, basically contains points which lie on this line. And you see, if you take this dotted line uh, that corresponds to that shifted lattice, then you see that you have three points which are inside three apex points, which are actually inside this gray domain. So you have, and so this three corresponds precisely to the dimension of the system. So if you take any rational number and take the parameters A and B like this, you get always this picture. And now the point is that, uh, so this uh, interlacing condition, or this apex point condition is now satisfied for this choice of alpha. However, uh, the theory is that, that you also have to take into account the multiples of alpha. However, if we multiply these alphas by any multiple, then the sums of the A and B will still be integers. And you will always find lattices, which still have these points, three points, which are on this line. So that means that this uh, uh, apex point condition, which I uh, showed, uh, is indeed satisfied. And that means that with this parameter choice, this parameter choice, the solution set is going to be algebraic. And uh, I found this very nice because uh, you can predict that just by staring at a picture uh, like this. Uh, there's another case which you can, which is not hard to see. Then if you take uh, A is a half and B is a third, then the, here's the shift of lattice that corresponds to it. You also see that there are three apex points. And the Galois transform of this, so for example, if I multiply this with five, then modulo one, this will still be a half, but modulo one, this will become two thirds. Uh, this will be the other point. But the nice thing is, um, so I made this green. So you see the shift that's consisting of the green points, but this shift let they also have all the points in the three points in this, uh, this dark gray area. So this choice of parameters also will give you um, algebraic solutions. So the result is that uh, with a little bit more work, you can show that the system is, is irreducible with finite monotomy if and only if these are the cases that, that occur. 
So this is the first case that I showed you, which we get by inspection. And with a little more effort, you get, uh, you get this. So A is a half mod C and B may have these values or uh, everything is symmetric in A and B. So it can also be the other way around. Uh, having uh, this parameter, it's an infinite number of choices of A and B uh, made me a bit curious if you could actually determine those solutions. Well, it turns out that if you take uh, this general A and take B equal to one minus A, you can actually show that this uh, coin series represents a function of this particular form. What is this? Well, F is an algebraic function in two variables. It uh, satisfies this cubic equation. Uh, G is also an algebraic function, which satisfies this cubic equation. Delta is a discriminant, which is this discriminant. And if you have all these data, then it turns out that you get precisely this identity. It took a bit of uh, guesswork to, to get it, but then, uh, well, once you have it, it's easy to verify that, that this is indeed uh, the, the, the solution. I didn't do uh, this one, but at least it illustrates a little bit that these, uh, these conditions, these apex point conditions can, uh, can bring you pretty far. And actually, a student of mine has taken um, uh, Estabot in her thesis, has taken all the Laricella cases and uh, actually applied this criterion to the Laricella cases and found a complete list of algebraic uh, Laricella functions, uh, for example, and also the, the Horn time series. So these are. Uh, basically the classical uh, hypergeometric series that, that people know. Okay, so maybe I should say something about the, the proof of this uh, apex point condition. It will be very brief. I'll just show you the steps. So the combinatorial condition, so this apex point condition, well, it's equivalent to this statement that uh, the A hypergeometric system has a maximal set of independent polynomial solutions, modulo p. So you can look at the A of arithmetic uh, system, modulo p, and then uh, try to find polynomial solutions. And if this number of independent polynomial solutions is equal to a rank, that's what we call a maximal set. And when I say independent, is it should be independent over uh, this ring, because uh, vi to the p's are also constants in characteristic P. So this is a, a, a well-known situation in the arithmetic of differential equation, because you can associate a D module to this A hypergeometric system. And then people say, well, it has a vanishing P curvature for almost primes, all primes P is an equivalent statement. And there's a famous conjecture by Grothendieck that says that the finish, vanishing of the P curvature for almost primes is equivalent to finite monodromy. So it's equivalent to having a solution space of algebraic functions. Uh, this is still a conjecture in general. However, uh, the conjecture has been proven by Nick Katz in 1972 for different systems of differential equations which come from uh, geometry or factors of Gaussmannian systems. And you can, with little effort, you can show that the A hypergeometric system with rational parameters does indeed come from algebraic geometry in the proper sense. Hence, you can apply Katz's theorem and you can work your way backwards and find that the apex uh, criterion suffices to get uh, a system, well, a complete set of solutions, which are algebraic functions. So this is uh, really a sketch of the proof. There's much more in it, of course, but I will not uh, do it. Uh, let me end by giving you uh, two problems, open problems. And the first is something I've been wondering about very much. Uh, so you, as you rem may remember that in the one variable case, uh, it was very easy to write down monodromy matrices because of this Level theory, because of this rigidity of one, hyper one variable hypergeometric functions. And uh, this rigidity made things extremely easy. And now you could wonder, uh, is there something like rigidity in the, in the A hypergeometric systems? Well, 
I have no idea whether this is going to work. I, I think uh, it, it, it would be fair justice if, if one could find actually a kind of rigidity structures for the AI programmatic system by which you can write down um, solutions quite easily or maybe less easily, but at least using linear algebra, something like that. But it's not clear to me. I, I know that uh, there are some cases, uh, some Japanese mathematicians who have managed to find a rigid structure, I think, for some of the Appel functions and also for an equation of Campe de Ferrier, which is a three dimensional version of the Appel functions. So there are, are some, some uh, hints that something like that uh, might, be, uh, might be possible. Well, but uh, apart from that, I think I told you already that uh, people have gone uh, pretty far now in determining generating matrices for uh, a hypergeometric systems, like the, the ones in the Laricella case uh, by the, the Japanese mathematicians like Matsumoto and Goto. Um, I myself have made some efforts by using so-called Mellon-Barnes integrals that uh, they didn't give you, well, it was only a applicable to a, a, a smaller set of uh, examples. And now there is a, a, a Matsubara uh, who recently found a way to connect uh, branches of uh, systems of, of a hypergeometric functions via something which is called the perestroika uh, uh, procedure in the, in the space of, of hypergeometric functions. It's very technical. But it looks like he, he found a way to actually uh, uh, construct something that looks like a, a monodromic group. Uh, one other thing that uh, one could ask is that in the one variable case in, in the paper of Gert Heckman and mine, uh, there is a complete list of one variable hypergeometric functions that are algebraic. Um, as I said, in the case of uh, Appel's functions, or uh, uh, Laurichella functions and horn functions. There is also a complete list by Esther Blot, but of course there are more a hypergeometric functions, and one might this might be a nice project to find a, the, the complete extension of this list to, to to basically having a list of all algebraic a hypergeometric functions. I have no idea whether this is doable or, or not. Well, with these uh, open problems, I would like to end my lecture. And just give you some references that you, uh, there's an enormous amount of literature, uh, but uh, for this, it's, it's a good idea to look at the papers. Uh, here I have the original papers of Galfond Kaprana and Zilovinsky. Uh, here I sneaked in uh, uh, an AMS notices article of mine, which contains a, a very light introduction to this uh, subject. And uh, there's a PhD thesis of uh, a student of mine, which is called Monitoring Properties in A Hypergeometric Functions. And he really made some effort in chapter two to give this uh, procedure to produce a uh, basis of solutions uh, when you start from this uh, mother of all, uh, of all solutions. So he, there it's done, with it. I think, I hope in, in a very lucid way. So anyone who's interested in that can. Uh, could, could take a look. Well, let me end my lecture here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a, a very wonderful talk. Uh, I'd like to ask are there some questions, please? Yes, could you add the Japanese references you just mentioned? I mean, in, in some note. Uh, the, the, the Japanese references. Uh, yeah, like Matsumoto, Goto, yes, so, so, Matsubara. Uh, yes, so there are, um, there's a paper of mine on, on the monodromy of hypergeometric functions in Kelle. And uh, I think the, the, there you find these extra references. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah.
you mentioned this uh, vanishing of p curvature uh, condition almost all p so do we know mm -hmm. which p's uh, are um, not there like we you have characterization of which p's uh, are excluded so, so that uh, well, the thing is that usually, usually the, the p's that occur in the the, the denominators of the parameters they they they're not going to you, you cannot so even so you can effectively yes yeah, so, so, you have to exclude well effective uh, okay. yes yeah, so if, if you do the carry out procedure you, you usually see that the primes which are not in the denominators uh, are going to work i see okay. so you can just check uh, if you can compute the periodic thing you can just uh, check the peak curvature and check whether it's algebraic or not uh, yes yeah, so what, what i usually do is convince myself that well produce recurrences and convince myself that there are enough uh, solutions and then I know, so I don't really compute uh, p curvatures. Uh, I just look at recurrences and, uh, well, establish that there are sufficiently many independent solutions. I hope this is, uh, but of course you you can compute the, the, the programs to compute these p curvatures as well, and, uh, which is much more informative, especially if p curvatures are not uh, zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a question from Masha Vasenko. Mm, yes, so if you restrict to uh, these a hypergeometric functions to classical hypergeometric functions, mm -hmm. do you get a new proof of your classification of algebraic hypergeometric functions by a new method, uh, I mean a different method uh, where you count solutions, polynomial solutions modulo p? Uh, that's uh, that's an interesting question. I, it, it, essentially, it basically all comes down to the same thing. If you look at it, uh, it's it's not really a, a, a new proof. So I think that the, the proof that I presented here is a bit of a, 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 a poor man's proof uh, because I don't know anything about uh, monodromy or. So in the one variable case, we had these Hermitian forms. And uh, th 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 there we use that to, to, to uh, distinguish uh, definite Hermitian forms and then establish algebraicity. Now, the thing is that in an indirect way, Katz, if you look at the Katz paper, he does something similar there. So also, they worked with, uh, with, with Hodge structure and there's also uh, uh, Hodge pairing. And uh, there he has also particular cases where there is a, a, a definite form which governs these uh, these, these hot structures. And th that's based, the, 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 in the one variable case, these Hermitian structures of Gert Hetman and mine are an incarnation of, of that more general structure. So in, in a way, um, I don't have the Hermitian part now, but essentially it's present in Katz's paper. Um, Maybe I'm confusing you a little bit, but I hope uh, the, the gist is uh, clear. Uh, so this is Katz's paper where he proves Grothendieck's conjecture for uh, picard fuchs equations. That's right? right. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for a nice talk. And isn't that? It a hypergeometric functions with the rational parameter say some algebraic varieties or something less or um, I'm not sure if I hear you well. So sometimes the connection is uh, the connection is not not so clear. So I is hear half of what you're saying. Hypergeometric functions coming from the algebraic geometry. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Maybe you can repeat yourself, Devendra, because your connection was breaking up. Yeah, yeah. So now maybe it is better. Hello. Am yeah. I audible? Yeah. We hear you. Hello. Yes. Yeah. So I was asking if uh, you said that a hypergeometric function with rational parameters are coming from algebraic geometry. That's so is right. It yes. Same as their period of uh, some algebraic variety or something less or more. Ah. Uh, okay. So so there's a. 
Yeah, so, so th th there's a, a fine point here because in, in ordinary uh, kind of Fuchs equations or Gaussmannian system, so you work with uh, 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 cohomology, uh, which is generated by the differential forms, and there you look at uh, the periods. However, in the hypergeometric case, uh, actually you, you look at differential forms, but they're twisted. So that means you, you have these fractional factors. And if you recall the, uh, the Euler integral, there you could see these fractional powers of, uh, of, of, of variables occurring. So they're not really rational functions that you're integrating, but they have some, 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 some well, people call them twisted differential forms. Now there are ways to remove these twists by introducing coverings. And this is what, uh, for example, Katz does in this, uh, in, in his 72 paper, and then work with these covers and, and, and apply the theory there. But it turns out that very often things become more complicated and what people sometimes do is accept these, um, th th these twisted forms and then integrate over twisted cycles. So this is what uh, many of the Japanese uh, do in their study of monodromy of these uh, higher uh, hypergeometric systems. They look at uh, twisted integrals of twisted cohomology and uh, they have developed a whole machinery for these twisted uh, uh, homology, complete with intersection forms and everything. So it becomes quite technical, but they, well, they, 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 it's the way they work. And I have a feeling that it's, uh, it may be a, a very good idea to actually stay with these twisted forms, accept them, and then uh, accept these the extra things that you get. So in the strict sense, that's what you say, uh, you don't have these integrals, but you do have uh, twisted uh, inter integrals over twisted cycles or twisted differential forms that will give you these <laughs> twisted, <laughs> twisted so, sorry about that, twisted periods. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Well, okay, maybe I, I can ask a question. So in some kind of applications of some work that I've, I've been involved with, we have had um, the, the particular groups that are monodromy groups of hypergeometric functions in two variables, but also the same groups of monodromy uh, groups of hypergeometric functions in one variable, but of a higher order. And uh, I, I then was quite fascinated by this trick you used where you combined all of your Vs into a single Z. So would you, in that example, are the monodromy groups the same when, whether you have your, your Z equation or your V equations? Uh, I, I think I see what you mean. So the, 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 the trick that I showed is, is not really my trick. It's just, uh, it belongs to the theory of these a hypergeometric functions. And it's really the, the, the idea of uh, Kapran, uh, Galvin Kapranov and Zilovinsky. So yeah. where, where they basically soak the, the differential equations in a bigger dimensional space and then everything becomes very simple. I think that's right. my way yeah. of viewing this. Okay. So it, it's not really the, uh, uh, so it's, it's basically a, simply the forming of, of a, a quotient. And so I guess the examples that you have seen are not simply examples of, of quotients, but um, uh, well, I, I, I do not, of course I do not know the examples, but I, I, I guess it, it takes a more detailed study to, uh, to, to, okay. to see what happens there. Okay. Okay, fine. So that was just a, yeah. So, I mean, because I've been, I've been, this is a question I've been thinking about for some time. And suddenly that, that, that the thing that you, you talked about there, maybe, sort of maybe made a light come on in my head. So I was just wondering. Ah, I, I see. Well, what, what, okay. So. Maybe we uh, can correspond about this separately. Yeah. Okay. I, I, okay. That's a good idea. Okay, so are there some more, more questions, please? Okay, well, if not, I would like to thank you once again for a very beautiful talk. I, I must say personally, I learned a lot and I'm sure that that's true of the, of the rest of the audience. So thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I ask a question? Oh, I'm the, sorry. Uh, about the PhD thesis, I just tried the, the uh, reference and it doesn't uh -huh. seem to work. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, I'll I'll try to fix that. I, I copied it, so maybe something went wrong with uh, copy paste. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look it, into it. It seems <laughs> it doesn't match any. Ah, I think I I typed correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I double checked myself. I, 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 tr I trust you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll 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 double check it and then I'll I'll, I'll forward it to to Devendra and maybe. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. That was a gorgeous talk. Oh, thank you. Yeah, great set of lectures, sir. Thank you. See you. Okay. Um, see you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, professor.